From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. I've been doing some mentoring to the undergrad students at the university where I'm working now. And it has helped me a lot to have this experience because now I can empathize with my students. My students tell me like I had this problem that I have to retire from this course because they have some issues with the pandemic and it was a lot of trouble, of trouble and a lot and I had a lot of problems with my family, being sick and dealing with university plus a sick family member that maybe needs to be hospitalized and at that time uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, especially here. There was not enough uh, uh, available space for sick people with COVID, so uh, my students suffer a lot. So you have to, I had to empathize with them, and this was a very good uh, having my own experience helped me a lot to see through their eyes. That was Juan Vega. Juan is an undergraduate engineering lecturer at the University of Engineering and Technology, UTech, in Lima, Peru. Juan has had a passion for additive manufacturing for a number of years and is in the process of looking for PhD opportunities in the space. I thought it would be int- insightful and interesting to have him on the show today to hear his perspectives on getting traction with the, within the additive manufacturing space coming from South America. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. Juan, welcome to the show today. I'm excited for the conversation. Uh, I think you're going to bring a, a really interesting perspective to our discussion today, and I'm excited to to chat. So, um, let's start kind of where we always do with with everyone to put some grounding, some context on kind of who you are and where you came from. So, um, share a little bit about your history, kind of where you grew up, kind of what brought you towards the additive manufacturing space, and 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 what you're doing now. Thank you very much, Mike, for the invitation, first of all. And well, uh, what I can tell you about me. I, uh, my name is Juan Vega. I am from Peru. Uh, I studied an undergraduate in mechanical engineering uh, here in Peru at the PUCP. I don't want to say the whole long name of the university. Uh, in, it's a very good university. Um, in, after that, I worked in the Peruvian dealer for Caterpillar machines, you know, these huge mining machines. And in there, while I was working there, I noted that there was a problem we were having with the new equipment. Uh, we have these new models we were receiving, uh, we were delivering to the mines, but when they came back for repair, we had some troubles because of the, we didn't, we didn't have the parts available to replace the ones that were damaged. And at that point, <laughs> I was thinking, uh, you know, that, that the problem that causes is that uh, their reparations get delayed. Uh, we talked to, the, to, to, uh, to our dealer, to our dealer, and they say, well, uh, you have to wait like six months for a, crankch- a new crankshaft, you know, this huge crankshaft. And they say, okay, well, we can wait, but our clients may want to use them, their machines as soon as possible. You know, mining is very demanding with their production times. So of course they have backup engines and everything, but we wanted to give the repairs a uh, timeline that was good for everybody. In order to do that at the time, uh, this was around 2014, uh, 2013, 2014, I was thinking like, well, there must be a way where in which we can manufacture, fabricate this kind of parts. Uh, but I don't want to mass produce them. I don't want to make like hundred or a thousand crankshaft of these huge machines. I just want to make maybe one or two today and tomorrow I will manufacture a cylinder head and the next day a cylinder block and the next day some pistons. So different parts every day. So. I need some equipment that is highly versatile to manufacture metallic parts. So at the time I didn't know there were technologies that were beginning to rise 
to have a solution for this problem. So I began doing my own research at the time and I discovered that there was this group of technologies called additive manufacturing that were that that were very much promising to uh, solve this kind of problem we had at the time. So I, I wished that we could have these machines and make the, these parts, as I was telling you. So <clears throat> then I said, OK, so this technology exists. Uh, it's you know, just developing. Yeah, this, just, this is the time where I can you know, become an expert and be you know, the leader in this kind of technologies here in my country and like worldwide even you know, to be an expert of these technologies. I really like the fact that we can do, uh, that we have, that there's an available fabrication method that is so versatile. During this time, uh, that, like this was like the, the seed of my main interest in metal additive manufacturing. So during that time, uh, I also saw another opportunities that were also solved by um, additive manufacturing. For example, one day I was looking at the, at the engines, like they were very huge, so I got moved around them. And I said, okay, so these, these are beautiful engines, like masterpieces of engineering. And what if we can make them in such shape that they're very efficient, like thermal, thermally, uh, thermally efficient, so the, they use less uh, fuel, so there's less uh, CO2, NOx production, less contamination, so less greenhouses, greenhouse gases, et cetera, et cetera. And then again, I found out, okay, additive manufacturing can help this out because these technologies allow for a more free uh, geometry, uh, the, uh, the, the possibility to manufacture uh, geometry uh, complex parts. And I say, okay, so that's it, that's decided. I, I will uh, uh, study these technologies. Uh, at the time, I came back to my university and talked to a professor and told him my ideas. And he told me, well, you should apply to a scholarship in Japan. I know a professor and there he's working on, or he wants to work with turbine plates uh, to manufacture turbine plates using 3D printing. And I say, okay, I, I, should, <laughs> I should go to this place. And that's, and that's how I applied to the scholarship. I was um, fortunate to get it. So I, won, I went to Japan, to the Kyoto University to study at the Professor Inui's laboratory. And in there, I performed research uh, for materials related to um, additive manufacturing you know, the, to, to, make, to make them feasible, you know, to study the feasibility of using them, uh, using these kind of technologies. So I studied the masters in material science and engineering. So it was mechanical engineering. So now shifting to material science. And it was really interesting. It was a really interesting experience. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. Uh, it was also very challenging because um, first uh, material science was not my background. So I have to study a lot to get the basics and to understand the more advanced course. The classes were given in Japanese language. So I, I, uh, my language, my Japanese language skills are mainly conversational. So I can have a conversation with somebody in the street or ask some food at the restaurant, but to the level of understanding advanced, uh, I don't know, metallography, crystallography, that's another subject. So how did, how did um, you learn Japanese to begin with? Oh, yeah. Um, when I found out that I won the scholarship, I studied with a professor, uh, well, sorry, with a, a language teacher uh, for about three months because then I went to Japan and in the first six months of the scholarship, uh, they uh, give you a course in the Japanese language. Okay. So there, this first experience in my home country with this teacher and then the six months they gave me a, but I, I think a decent uh, Japanese level to at least uh, ask for some food at the restaurant and don't starve. So. Uh, it and that's, was, pretty, yeah. that, that's pretty brave to go to a completely, I mean, 
Japanese isn't the easiest language to learn and to kind of jump right in and for especially a technical degree, that's, that's, that's impressive. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, it was very demanding, um, but it was interesting because uh, here in my home country, there's a heavy influence of the Japanese culture. Uh, I, in South America, there's, I think even in the world, uh, well, now things have changed a little bit, but the Peru was the second uh, largest, uh, well, the it's the country with the single largest Japanese community outside Japan, the first one being Brazil. So maybe that's changed a little bit with the USA and people from Japan going to the USA, but if we are not second place, we're third place. And the culture is very heavily uh, grounded here in, in the country from food and the TV shows too. We had so a lot of TV shows, especially when we were kids, that uh, at the beginning we didn't understand and. I always like to tell this story, so I don't know if you allow me a minute to tell it. Um, there was this kids program for mathematics. Well, it, 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 uses a, it was a guy and a puppet. And they have like three or four chapters for counting. Like uh, you, you grab a pen and this is one pen, this is two pens, three pens. Then the another chapter was for books, uh, one book, two books, three books. And then the other one was for apples, one, one apple, two apples, three apples. And I said, okay, yeah, I, I only need one chapter to learn to count. I don't need so many. Why there are so many chapters uh, <clears throat> in this TV show for counting? And for a, a Spanish speaker, native speaker, it doesn't make sense. For an English speaker, it also doesn't make any sense. But for a Japanese, uh, speaker it does make sense because they have different ways to count uh, flat objects long objects round objects and <clears throat> when i went there and they taught us how to count that's when it made the click yeah. oh that's why they have like three or four chapters for this tv show when i was a kid like a lot of things that i didn't understand at the time when i was a kid like they make the click. So as you said, very different cultures. Uh, the cuisine is very good. So uh, Japan, Japan was and is an amazing place to explore and to be a, a student, an undergraduate or a graduate student. Uh, if anybody wants to have an international experience, I highly recommend it. It's, it's an, an amazing experience. So, as uh, what are you what are you doing now? So you're not you're not in Japan. You're back in Peru. You're gonna what's, oh, yeah. uh, what's what are you doing now? Okay, I complete my story. Um, in Japan, uh, we study the feasibility of printing uh, these alloys to be used uh, with SLM, the selective laser melting. Um, after that, unfortunately, um, the we couldn't continue the project of 3D printing because the availability of the 3D printer was not as easy to get. So uh, I came back to, well, I finished my master's, I published a paper about the, our findings, and then I came back to Peru and began teaching undergraduate students first uh, at my own university and now at another university called GeoTech in the University of Engineering and Technology. <coughs> and, over there, I uh, began teaching like classical physics for engineering, like uh, dynamics, uh, material, uh, uh, structural materials, and that kind of courses. And there was this one course, which is very interesting that I hope after this pandemic uh, finishes, we can retake is the, this interdisciplinary project in which we try to 3D print um, houses in the Andes using the materials that we had around. So I think Penn State had, well, not only Penn State, but several, there was an, um, a contest for 3D printing houses in Mars. I remember one of the finalists was Penn, Penn State University with their project, but there were many, many contenders. Um, well, taking that idea, like the Andes are not Mars, but 
we have uh, some limited resources. Uh, so over there, so I say, okay, I asked the kids because the undergraduate students had to first uh, come up with the material, you know, a material ideal for printing Adobe, you know, the, these bricks made of mud and uh, usually a fiber that's reinforced it. Uh, we wanted to use each of its each is, is a kind of grass that grows in the Andes. It's very abundant, so maybe it was a good idea, but they have to make the balance so later the printer does not clog and <laughs> it cannot print. So it was an interesting course. Uh, at the beginning, since the, the pandemic began, uh, we couldn't make it on campus. So a lot of the interactions were like this, no? using Zoom. Um, it was not the same. Uh, I, I would think it was it would have been better if they had more. Uh, the, they have the tools uh, at the university available, right? the machine to make the testing and everything. But in any case, it was a very good experience, and we decided not to continue the course because um, because the pandemic was uh, continued. So uh, the the later experience was to build actually the printer or, or at least a prototype and continue with that idea. Uh, but well, we stop and I hope we can retake it this semester. Now that I, let's hope the pandemic proceeds a little bit. But in any case, uh, I was involved in with undergraduate students. Uh, I also wrote a paper with, <coughs> with my, um, my home university, you know, the university where I studied, uh, about uh, the mechanical design of uh, this cleaning process to manufacture cut good threads. You know, these threads that they are usually um, used to uh, manufacture shooter threads. When you got the cut, you have to, <coughs> uh, to go to a doctor and they you know, fix you. <laughs> they use these kind of threads and also very interesting uh, experience because from a long time, uh, after finishing the master's that I was involved in a heavily uh, research-oriented university like Kyoto University, then came back here, it was more centered on doing uh, teaching. But this project, and also I began to get involved with the 3D printers at my university, using uh, polymers, um, uh, the FDM uh, printers, and there was this also this other polyjet uh, printer that we could, at the beginning, we couldn't make it print uh, in color uh, gradients, and we managed to fix it out. It, it was very interesting to, to work in, the, in those um, printers that were not metal, because my experience was mainly with metal printers. So I also learned a lot from these uh, polymer machines. And uh, it also gave me a different perspective of, on additive manufacturing in general, uh, especially from the, from the sense of the machines. I, I had, from my experience uh, at Kyoto, I had an experience from the material side of the, of the equation, let's say, of, of from additive. And now I had an experience more closely related to the machines, repairing them, how they work, how to control them. Uh, the students uh, wanted to make their own printer. They actually, you know, they, they got all the, all the tubes, all the structural uh, steel, like to make a small printer by themselves and they make it work, um, <clears throat> programming and et cetera. And it was really interesting learning from them uh, too. So, so now, like as you've, you it kind of gone into the academic side, seen a lot of different 3D printers and worked with some kind of, how does that tie back to some of your original experience at working kind of with Caterpillar equipment and thinking about that problem? Are you more excited, less excited about the potential of using 3D printing in, in those applications? Yeah, actually I'm more excited because um, with uh, by using polymer printers, like I know, I now know that the problems we had at the 
at the shop at the time, we can sell with 3D printers, fantastic 3D printers. Like if you want to make a special tool for disassembling some seal or some difficult gear that's <coughs> in a part of the engine, you can use um, jigs or you can use um, these tools that you can fabricate using plastics and using additive manufacturing with polymers. So that's another perspective that I gained. And also by doing research and knowing that now people are more interested in 3D printers, I decided to continue um, to continue my education because I stopped at master's. But then they say, OK, no, I, if I want to continue educating this young generation of engineers, I need to be a PhD and be an expert in this in this um, area and also not only have the academic experience, but also the industrial experience. So that's why currently I'm applying to some universities to study the PhD in, well, in I decided to apply sometimes in mechanical engineering, sometimes in material science and engineering, because now the research, um, well, each university has their own uh, way they order their department. And some professors that are doing, that are in the mechanical engineering uh, department, they do research on the material science uh, part of the additive manufacturing. So the <clears throat> applying to one or to, to another, it depends on the university. And now the research line between one degree or the other is very diffuse especially if you want to be an expert in additive because it involves both, knowing both of the, uh, having knowledge in both of the degrees, uh, both uh, mechanical and material science, and even it's, it's bigger than that. No? That's, uh, additive manufacturing is a very interdisciplinary subject. So in that sense, that's, uh, I search for universities that has a high focus on, additive manufacturing and now I am applying to their to some research groups that focus on mainly in metal in metallic materials uh, uh, additive manufacturing but uh, that has they, they usually have a very big institute that they study like a broad um, say, series of techniques all related to additive manufacturing yeah that was one of the biggest things that I found challenging after my undergrad was uh, like undergraduate, you kind of pick a degree. It's still fairly broad, but every university has mechanical engineering. Most universities have mechanical engineering, materials engineering. When you get into the PhD realm, you've got a bunch of things you're balancing kind of the general department, but then the kind of research areas that your professors might be interested in. And you see, you're, you're trying to like constantly look at, what papers have they published and what's recently are they working on? How big is their group? And so they're, um, I found it more overwhelming than undergrad just in some ways to, to look at the more specific that, that you get and, and try to predict that out. What do you want to spend the next four or five years on in terms of, of researching and where do you want to live? Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to have into consideration. As you said, doing research to find the right uh, fit for you and for them is very challenging. Like I spend a lot of time um, researching the different universities, their programs, uh, what they offer, what I can offer to them, what they are interested and what I am interested. I have talked to some of the professors um, that do research in metal additive manufacturing. So it has been a good experience. Actually, your, pod, your podcast has helped me out a lot because I could hear from the professors directly what are their interests, uh, what do they want, why do they search for, what do they think about the technology and how it's going to develop in the next two to five to 10 years. And it has been very uh, enriching for me. So yeah, as you said, yeah, understanding and preparing to be in the right place, it's, it's very tough, but it's also very satisfying. 
So I hope uh, soon I got news, I get some news from the universities and I got some acceptation and then I can go to study uh, over there and you know, continue a doing the specialization in IT manufacturing. So how did you kind of make your decisions, even in terms of applying? I know you're kind of in, in the process, so I think people will appreciate kind of your experiences in, in more detail, but kind of as you started the process of, of this big funnel of like, hey, I want to study added manufacturing. The good thing is there's not that many, there's a lot of universities that have like small groups around it. There's not many that have big groups. Um, but kind of what were some of your, uh, what was your measuring stick? Like, I guess, what were some of the things you were judging the, the programs on or what were interest areas that, that you learned about as you went through that process that might be able to help some of, someone starting in that process from scratch? Oh, that, that's a great question. So the first thing I have to clarify was what, what do I want to do? Like the first thing is, what do I want to exactly do in these four, as you said, four or five years of study? So when I had that clear and I want to do, I want to do research related to the processing structure, uh, properties, uh, uh, performance of metal materials in additive. So I know now that that's my goal. Now that I have clear that's my goal, now I have to look for uh, the papers that I like motivated the most to me for doing this kind of research. And by reading the papers, I found about the professors. So then I follow the professors. Sometimes they move, you know, they are doing research in this university and now they are in this other university. So I have to follow them. Um, and I, I have used LinkedIn a lot for that because usually it's more updated that the websites uh, from the universities, uh, they sometimes, some of them are very updated and some of them are, are not. So uh, I was like blessed when I found out the ones that were very updated. So I said, okay, yeah, this is what they're doing here and there. And, but the other ones I have to find out and I have to do a little more of the hunting uh, of these professors where they go and what they're doing now. And that's one thing. So first, uh, understanding what you want, then uh, finding through the papers what uh, where are the professors you are interested. The other, I would say in parallel that I did was to search for programs, like whole programs uh, from universities that are interested in these technologies. Uh, so at, at in the, there's a a lot in England, for example, that are interested in IT manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot in the USA now. Uh, Singapore is also a power force in IT manufacturing. So there are a lot of places that have this uh, interested in IT manufacturing. And in, in each of these countries, there are also universities that have whole programs or whole um, institutes or centers that are dedicated to IT manufacturing in general. So once I look uh, for each of them, I also try to understand what's their focus, because for some of them, they want to do polymers or ceramics. And if I am more interested in metals, then uh, it's not like I discard them, but I put them in like, okay, this is the ones, but they do polymers mainly. I will search later if they have a metal, a professor in metals, but if not, I should, I should search in some place else and like that. And that's how I began filtering for the, for the programs. And after that, um, I found the, I, I made the matches. So, okay, this professor uh, that I found the papers that I really like, oh, he's working at this, at this university and this university has a huge program for additive manufacturing. So oh, that's good. Uh, sometimes there's a university that has an amazing professor doing the research you want to do, but the, he's only one professor in a university. So, uh, you also have to be very careful because if you apply and maybe you get to the university, but maybe that year you're unlucky and that professor doesn't have some funding, then uh, you will not be able to perform the research you want to do because you will have to probably search for another uh, professor that will receive you at that university. So that's one issue you also have to check out. Uh, so that's why university with bigger programs, with their institutes that are 
dedicated to additive manufacturing uh, in the subject you want, okay, that you have bigger chances there because you also want to do or you want to do research in what they are doing research now and they, they have more professors that are doing research similar to what you want to do. Maybe the professor you want the most is not available, but the second one is. So that's also very good. Um, then you have more chances. And after that, well, of course, you prepare all your, your whole past application package and try to do the best to make a good statement of purpose. Um, I also, at the time, contacted some professors. Uh, some of them were uh, very nice with me and give me the chance to talk with them. Some of them were very busy and were not available at the time, but in any case, uh, talking to them also is a very good idea because it gives you a perspective of what they think, of what they want. And sometimes they are very honest and they say, okay, you know, this year I don't have any funding. So it's better if you, if you have a opportunity to go to someplace else you do because uh, as I said, no, he, maybe he's the only one that is doing that kind of research at that university and if he's not going to be available, then you should consider uh, another place. And that's also very important because applications are expensive. And Yeah, I was going to uh, mention that, right? <laughs> it pays to narrow it down a bit. <laughs> so it's, uh, in average, I will say it's around, it's around 85 to ninety dollars, but you also have to send your TOEFL. At least for international students, you have to send your TOEFL results. So they, it adds another twenty dollars, and you also have to send the GRE results in, at some universities. Um, that also adds another thirty dollars. So you have to add all these numbers, and you have to multiply them by the number of universities you are considering. So if you have the list of universities. The more tailored possible, it's better for you because you were you will expend less money and you will have more chances to be admitted. Right, and it's it sounds like you're also already doing the right thing in terms of like making some contact out which with these professors say, hey, like, do you have any openings? I'm interested in this. Like that networking is so necessary. Um, I mean, that's how I found mine is like an uh, advisor of um, that I was working with at MIT, knew kind of some of the, the ongoing openings at, at Loughborough when, when I was kind of doing my selection. But it was one of those things where like, hey, there was an opening, you kind of get shortlisted because they know who you are, like they can put a face to a name. They, <laughs> and, exactly. and so it's um, that work that you put up front is gets you to a point where in some cases the application is more of a formality than, than anything. And, and hopefully yep. that gets, gets, gets you all the way. Um, so kind of just a follow up to that when um, for me, one of the interesting, one of the big decision factors that I was looking at when I was going for a PhD and, and if you would have asked me like, when I started undergrad, if I ever would have wanted to do a PhD, I would have said, hell no, like, that sounds awful. <laughs> like I don't want to spend my life in, in academia. Um, but I think what I kind of wrestled with as I went further was being, having a place because not all universities, research institutions are created equal, right? Some are more theoretical, some are looking farther out, some are more fundamental research, some are more applied and practical. And, and I really skewed towards that, that practical side and, 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 and found a place where I could work at a company during my PhD and kind of get practical experience and the related to what I was doing. And, um, and, and so for me, like that was a big deciding factor versus other things like teaching or more fundamental research or, or just doing papers. And so that kind of for, for you, I mean, like you're teaching now and, and so in your current role, so um, how much is a, is, is teaching a, a part of your decision process? Actually, yes. Um, as you said, uh, you have to consider a lot of things regarding what you want to do later after the PhD. So uh, it's, it's interesting that 
as you said, you find the perfect fit. It's not as easy as it sounds. There's always um, trade-offs, right? Yeah, there, there's trade-offs, and you you have to prioritize prioritize some things over others. So uh, it's it's not easy. So uh, as I said to my friends, like I wish to have like that problem. No, I, I wish to have like all the universities I applied, all of them accepted me. So I have the problem to decide. Okay, which one of them I I should go because it's 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 a it's a problem to have, <laughs> so uh, you can you can make a decision based on 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 the best possible scenario for you. But going back to teaching, like yes, uh, actually, after doing the research in Japan and coming back and doing teaching and also doing some research in parallel, that made me realize that I like it a lot the university environment. Um, I. I also did some did some work like I worked before, as I told you, in caterpillar. Well, in that caterpillar dealer here, and I enjoyed the experience a lot. But I I really liked the fact that I could teach, like I could share my knowledge with the students in the in the case of university. So that's as you said, that's a factor. So uh, that's why I actually I want to continue the going through the PhD path to be able to have the PhD degree that's necessary to apply to, a, to an academic position. But uh, that's going to be like after maybe five years the finishing the PhD because I also want to get on hands experience, as you said. Uh, solving problems at the industry, you have to be very quick. You have to um, decide uh, very, very fast. You have to think very fast. So I like that. I, I like to have this uh, wake, uh, like awake uh, kind of state of mind where you are um, uh, thinking quick and efficiently for solutions for your clients or you know the issues you usually deal at, at, the, at, an, at the business. So uh, I first, after PhD, that's my plan. I, I want to do some work at the company uh, that does uh, or that works with additive manufacturing. Uh, if it's closer to the thing I do research about, the better. But well, let's see. You, you don't know what the what the future <laughs> brings you. Uh, but in any case, if it's better if I do something related to that, and later then I want to go back to my country to do some teaching and do working as a professor. That's the ideal plan. Of yep. course, the ideal plans can change. Uh, but in any case, so far, that's that's the how I have structured. Yeah, and for me, like the, the transition out after PhD was one of the most challenging things for me because it was, um, you spend so long getting very narrow into a, a topic area and if there are a lot of kind of straight line jobs I, I call them like go kind of start a research group do a postdoc like stay in academia and kind of go down that path the other part is kind of going in into industry but essentially going along the same lines as finding like someone that needs a materials engineer that does that specific research that you were doing and, and apply it to a company. I think when you get outside of those areas, many companies, at least that I found, didn't really know how to handle a PhD or like what to like what to do with them, right? Because they're they're not experienced employees, but they're older, right? Like they're in their late 20s, 30s, but then they also don't have like they're very experienced in terms of one narrow field, but uh, and and so companies didn't like it was hard to articulate kind of what value they could bring to an organization other than okay you're very specific in that like and that's all we'll use for um, which wasn't for me wasn't what I was looking for is kind of some different um, ways to to grow in different parts of of business and industry and so that that's for me what what was the most challenging after finishing my PhD. Yeah, yeah. Something I, to look but, uh, forward to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, it's it's a challenge. Uh, you know, it's it's also a job to to work on the transferable skills you have for from academia to industry. It's not an easy transition. 
uh, especially if you don't have previous industrial experience. No? At least, uh, as I've told you, I have some industrial, uh, five years working at, at industry, so I have some experience. Uh, but uh, in any case, for somebody who has done like the undergraduate and master's and PhD and have not gone outside academia, uh, the transition can be, I wouldn't say it's hard because this is, these people are smart, the PhD, so they work hard and they're smart. That's for guarantee. But uh, they have to realize that the industry works in a different way. There's also the egos that have to change. Some people like to have, or well, it's not like they like to, but they develop some ego uh, after the working uh, the PhD and having the doctor before their names. And so that's also something you have to learn how to manage. And I guess that's something I, well, I hope in very soon to be dealing with, uh, but I, ha I have to start thinking about it because it's going to happen. Um, but it's a good challenge, I think, um, in the sense that you are doing what you, at least I, I, I want to do what I'm really like uh, what I discovered, like this uh, eureka moment I had when I was working and I have done the master's and I want to continue doing the PhD. I went, I want to be an expert in this field. So that motivates me to, to do what is necessary to do. Yeah? It's, it's not, uh, everything is not like the, uh, it's like they say in Spanish, you know, there's the roses has their spines. You, know? you have the beautiful part, but you also have the harsh parts that you have to do. Um, so you have to work through them and I think it's going to be nice. So uh, it's, uh, the only thing is that you have to work hard and that's, that, that's, and that's true that you can't change. For sure. And so kind of last, last question before we wrap up here, um, I don't have to check in with you in a couple of, of months to see where things are going, but kind of, um, kind of what, what advice would you give people that are thinking about a PhD or want to kind of in industry, looking to get back into academia, maybe to further their career? Are there any kind of nuggets of advice that, that, that you could give after your experience as you're kind of going through it right now? Like what, what wish would, do you wish you would have known? Um, well, I believe that a very important part of uh, graduate school in general, it's your own mental health. Uh, you have to be aware of how you are doing, especially if you are in a country outside of your own and you are doing uh, postgraduate uh, studies uh, outside your own, the comforts of your own country. You don't have the family close. I did in Japan where the language is not as easy or as um, straightforward as it's doing in some place else or like a Spanish speaking country in, in my case. So you have to be um, humble enough to recognize when uh, you have to call from help if you need it. At, at, for me, at some point, I had some issues in Japan. Uh, and I believe that at the beginning, I didn't, handle it, I didn't handle them very good because I was not humble enough to recognize that I needed help. Uh, luckily for me, I have some good friends over there that told me, okay, wait, you, you should solve these issues. And you should call for help when it's needed. And, and, that's, um, and that's something I, I did. And luckily for me, I, I kind of solved them at the time. But it's very important that you have to deal with your own mental health. You know, I, I know that it's easier to see if your, like your health, your overall health is, is okay because you're feeling good or you're feeling sick. Or, or you're doing exercise or you're eating well, that's like more or less easy to see, but for your own mind, it's more hard or it's harder to, to understand that. So it's, it's about to, to be able to recognize when somebody else, maybe you don't recognize it, but somebody else does and, and you have to listen to, to these people and, recognize this advice. And actually this helped me a lot because now um, I've been doing some mentoring to undergrad students at the university where I'm working now. And it has helped me a lot to have this experience because now I can empathize with my students. My students tell me like, 
I had this problem that I have to retire from this course because they have some issues with the pandemic and it was a lot of trouble of trouble and a lot and I had a lot of problems with my family being sick and dealing with university with, plus a sick family member that maybe needs to be hospitalized and at that time uh, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, especially here there was not enough uh, uh, available space for sick people with COVID so uh, my students suffered a lot so you have to I had to empathize with them and this was a very good uh, having my own experience helped me a lot to see through their eyes and try to say to them like if you cannot do it right now just do it next semester uh, it's better to postpone it a little bit than to like risk your own mental health and maybe um breaking at the end of the of the semester and it's not going to be good for you you can get very sick if you are if you if you continue through this path so that's i think that's the main um advice that we we'll give to everybody else uh, regarding graduate school and well the application processes i, I think it, i i said before you have to work very hard and do a lot of your research to find the right fit for you but uh, in the case of something that people don't tell you very much about, it's I think it's mental health. Well, it's great that you're kind of giving back to to, to the students there and 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 sharing your story and much appreciated on on that. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed the conversation today. I'm excited for kind of what's ahead for your career and and seeing where where you can go in the additive manufacturing space and. Uh, like I said, we'll have to check in in a few, a few months when, and uh, a few years when you're, you're, you're doctor, you got the doctor in front of your name and, and doing a lot of good work. So thank you for t- your time today and uh, good luck with everything ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much for the interview, Mike. I hope my experiences or uh, what I have told you today help somebody else too. And uh, let's talk soon.